Hey everyone, and welcome to the Youth Perspective on the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, Day 3. My day at CND today was dominated predominantly by one country, the Russian Federation. Um, so they held a side event earlier with a very long name, so I'm not going to read it all, but it was about uh, drug trafficking and drug related money laundering, and in particular, uh, how this connects with cybercrime. So I went, even though it was not something I would usually attend at CND, I have to say. Um, it was co-sponsored by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, um, so I wanted to go and see what was so significant that the UN Office on Drugs and Crime was co-sponsoring a side event about with the Russian Federation, um, considering everything that's happening in Ukraine at the moment. I went and the possibility for engagement was quite limited. Um, there was no possibility to comment anything or use any reactions on the um, webinar platform that they were using. And they also prevented entry and removed um, a number of civil society members based off of the name that they had in their account uh, referencing Ukraine or anything like that. So, yeah. Disappointing side event, um, but in, interesting to see what the Russian Federation is talking about at the moment. Um, they also made a statement today in the plenary, which um, was slightly more outrageous. Um, they essentially accused the Ukrainian Ministry of Health, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was health, but some Ukrainian ministry um, of coordinating and uh, dealing drugs in Russia. So obviously this is um, an outrageous accusation to make at the United Nations, I feel. Um, and while they didn't explicitly use it as a justification for their invasion of Ukraine, uh, it is of course heavily implied that it is a justification for their invasion of Ukraine. Um, it's worth noting as well that Russia recently bombed a hospital in Mariupol. Uh, in this hospital was a clinic for opioid agonist treatment. Um, Russia has shown um, that they believe that the Donetsk Oblast, where Mariupol is located, is part of Russia. Um, so it seems like they may be trying to justify their actions here. They may be trying to justify the war crimes they're committing in Ukraine. And while Russia attempts to justify their actions, while they attempt to justify their war crimes, um, the people who use drugs in both Russia and Ukraine are suffering. And while member states make statements um, condemning Russia's actions, Russia's aggression, they seldom refer to the people involved in this instance and certainly not the people who use drugs uh, involved, which you would think would be of particular importance to the delegates attending CND. Um, it is unfortunate that in this diplomatic posturing, um, the needs of our community in Russia and Ukraine um, are being forgotten about. Hi. Uh, my third day at CND, um, the side event I attended was the uh, current challenges faced by the Asian regions uh, for it being uh, one of the largest drug trafficking route. Um, being from uh, one of the countries from South Asia, uh, I have heard, I have known about Golden Triangle and Golden Crescent. Uh, and the drug trafficking routes from uh, from them connecting to India. So this uh, in, this event gave me uh, in, uh, insights about how these uh, drug trafficking routes are developed, uh, and uh, these are not long lasting. Rather, they adapt to ways to overcome challenges. Uh, so the most recent challenge for them uh, them. I use for drug traffickers uh, was uh, the uh, supply, production, and sale of the substances. Uh, most of the uh, drug traffickers have shifted to online 
uh, platforms uh, for uh, dealing with drugs um, and there's a cl clear demarcation or when it comes to sale and purchase of drugs uh, it has it is kept to clear net and when it comes to production uh, that's when the dark net comes into the scene hello again i'm galalina and today was the third day of the cnd I attended two side events. The first one is called the Global Drug Policy Index 2021, a global tour for evaluation and accountability. This side event in particular was very interesting for me because last year Youth Rise participated in everything that has to do with the GDPI, the advocacy activities for implementing the GDPI in, in the world and also um, the communications from this index to be used for to be used by everyone. Sorry, um, this side event had panelists uh, from every part of the world. Maria Alba, our IWG, she represented Latin America very very good. Also had the participation of Ari Madden from Harm Reduction Australia and input. She was very interesting because she explained a little bit more how we can use the GDPI for advocacy and how to use this uh, important index in order to use it as a tool to present this, uh, this index to the parliamentarians and to uh, people in governments to, ex to start sorry, uh, explaining them or asking them for the activities or the demands that we have as civil society for the for drug policy reform. And also was very interesting the input for from Dr. Matt Walls. Uh, he sorry, he explained very properly also the methodology that the GDPI used. Today in the informal dialogues with Ms. Gadawali, who is the executive director of UNODC, I got to ask a question on behalf of Youth Rise regarding data collection by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, UNODC collects all sorts of sorts of data, particularly uh, to justify understandings of risks, benefits, patterns, and motives of drug use. And our question was particularly about the data collection uh, regarding young people. And this is a question that us at Youth Rise and other youth organizations like SSDP have been trying to submit for a couple of years um, because we feel that data collection can be quite skewed, especially because young people in large parts of the world um, tend to feel uncomfortable to disclose drug use uh, to professionals, including researchers, um, for the fears of repercussions to them or their community. And this leads to kind of strange or uh, not always accurate data uh, being used in reports of the UNODC, such as the annual World Drug Report that they produce. Uh, but we also know that youth-led youth organizations like us at Youth Rise, um, who work with young people who use drugs, uh, we also collect this kind of data in a safe and trusted manner um, so we could help paint an accurate picture of young people's drug use. Um, so our question to the UNODC that I asked today was if there were any efforts planned uh, by the UNODC to empower more peer-led organizations to collect this kind of data independent of any university or government-funded research and whether the UNODC have any plans to use this method of data collection to address gaps in the existing data. To this question, uh, Ms. Wally said that they do not use this method of data collection currently. Uh, we knew that, um, but she also went on to explain that um, UNODC always aims to use diverse sources of data and encourages countries to do so as well, to make uh, the picture presented by the data as comprehensive, complete, and accurate as possible. Um, so she said that she will make note of this uh, recommendation and talk to the research team of UNODC 
um, and look into uh, working with peer-led organizations for data collection. Uh, so in case that actually happens, we really hope it does, uh, we would be really, really happy to work with the UNODC uh, to make sure that um, the picture and the data presented about young people's drug use um, is accurate as accurate as possible. Today at CND, we also had an informal dialogue with the Executive Director of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, Ms. Gada Wali. So uh, this is an opportunity for us to ask questions. Uh, they are submitted beforehand and Gada Wali will then answer them for us in this uh, Q&A session, sort of. So there's two questions that in particular that I want to talk about, um, both on the topic of decrim, coming from two different angles. Um, from two of our partner organizations. The first one is from the International Drug Policy Consortium, um, who asked about what the UNODC are doing in order to meet the target set by the global AIDS strategy um, that there are less than 10% of countries criminalizing the possession of a small amount of drugs by 2025. Um, the answer to this I found a little bit insatisfactory. Um, essentially just abdicating responsibility, um, listing other ways in which UNODC and UNAIDS have uh, created partnerships. Uh, they have joined together to advocate for reducing stigma and discrimination and promoting human rights and evidence-based public health-centered approaches to drug use and HIV. Um, throughout this answer, she really doesn't give any indication as to what they're doing to actually implement decrim, um, more so just that they're working with UNAIDS um, and yeah, they're going to do an advocacy campaign in, in Africa to reduce stigmatization of people who use drugs, which is not decrim um, and is not what this question was asking. So the second question I want to talk about today uh, was about the UN common position on drugs. Uh, this common position has largely been ignored by the UNODC and it promotes uh, alternatives to conviction and punishment in appropriate cases, including the decriminalization of drug possession for personal use. So this recommendation in particular, uh, recommending the decriminalization of drug possession for personal use in certain, certain cases uh, is quite a controversial statement in the UNODC um, and the question asked very directly, how does the UNODC interpret this recommendation? Uh, this was a really good question. I was, I was really happy to see this asked. Uh, I was slightly less happy with the answer that was given. Um, <clears throat> the answer starts with, is it important to discuss the interpretation of the UNODC or the interpretation of the member states? Um, so essentially, um, the answer is that this is not relevant to the UNODC. Uh, what is relevant is how member states use this document and um, the answer ends um, with Miss Wally saying that she believes that the role of the UNODC should continue to be to support member states to provide a range of options and a range of ways to support and implement the wide range of non-custodial measures. Um, very vague terms being used for what was quite a specific question um, and I was a bit disappointed to see this answer sort of yeah not answering the question and very much dancing around the topic of decriminalization. Hi, today I attended uh, an event dubbed Drug Policy in Asia, the importance of intersectional perspectives. We had speakers from the Asian community and one from Malaysia talked and shared a story of a transgender person who for five years wanted help for drug use but no treatment center would be willing to accept transgender people as they did not know where to put them. That is, uh, are they going to put them in a women's uh, quarters or the men's quarter? Most stories were shared on intersectionality of gender, poverty, age and drug use and this shed light on how drug policies have impacted women, transgender people and young people in Malaysia. From Pakistan, Yeshi gave an overview 
of the state of Pakistan in terms of the kind of punitive policies and laws that they must bear with from criminalization of key population communities uh, to the fact that they don't have opioid substitution therapy in their country as well as PEP programs for people who use drugs in Pakistan. This evidence shows that uh, this dynamics of multiple identities and criminalization has affected negatively their mental health, human progress as well as access to and uptake of HIV and sexual and reproductive health and rights services. This calls for action for drug policy change, an urgent need to call for the reforms of punitive laws into a tailored based services that are inclusive with transactional perspectives. Thank you. The first side event that I attended today was titled Drug Policies in Context, Poverty, Criminalization and Discrimination Against Women. Now the event was um, organized by Equis, I can't pronounce the name, it's in um, Spanish, I think, possibly Portuguese, not good, so good at languages. Um, and it was about um, women in Latin America that are involved in the drug trade, um, crop production, and um, trafficking in some cases. There was speakers um, all from Latin America talking about their experience as women who've been involved in the drug trade, how they got involved in it and how poverty is the reason that a lot of them cannot get out of it. They demanded that the governments give them other options if they don't want them to be involved in illicit crop production, that they, the government provides other options that are actually good enough to be able to support them the way that illicit crop production has in the past. They also wanted the, uh, they also spoke about um, how when you are a woman who's been in prison, it follows you for the rest of your life. They spoke about not being able to get identification cards or cert certificates of identification, um, the impact that being in prison has on, on the children and the need for them to be at home. Um, it talk, they talk about the lasting impact of prison on their lives and how um, they have struggled for a long time as a result of it and that prison doesn't end when you leave, that you serve your time and you still have to suffer the consequences of what you've done for a long, long time because of the criminalization of drugs, drug production and no other options available to them as women living in poverty. I also attended another side event organized by Argentina, my country, it has a name in Spanish, so I'm going to read it, but basically it was a side event about homelessness and people who use drugs. Uh, the name of this side event was Cuidar y Acompañar a las Personas en Situación de Calle Atravesadas por Consumos Problemáticos de Drogas, Herramientas para un Abordaje desde una Perspectiva de Derechos Humanos. This side event was organized by Intercambios Asociación Civil and the CEDRONAR, which is the main program uh, from the government of Argentina for people who use drugs, for also for problems regarding drug use. And it was very interesting as well because it addressed homelessness and people who use drugs, but from, uh, from um, human rights uh, approach and also how, or maybe not how, but what can we do as civil society to attend these problems uh, with a very accurate, um, yeah, sorry, but I don't know how to say it properly this, but, but addressing this problem, not just from the academia, but also what are the, the needs of the people who live in the streets, because the streets is not a place to live basically. So what can we do to help these people, not only with their, drug uh, problems or their drug use, but also how to help them also to be safe, not in the street, but in a shelter or how to um, help them to get a house or an apartment or a job or the identification number, something more like that. So it was very interesting also to be able to participate in this side event because it was not only about drugs, but also about all the problems that people who live in the street uh, basically face every single day. So thank you. Uh, 
D3 for CMD. I attended side event titled Social Support Experience on Homeless People uh, Who Use Drugs, organized by European Treatment Centers for Drug Addicts since Euro TC, uh, Reverse Charity Society, and World Federations Against uh, Drugs, where three different panelists presented. The sessions uh, talked about the facts uh, regarding uh, homeless people who inject drugs where it highlighted uh, substance abuse is often a cause of uh, homelessness and youth age 12 to 17 are at greater risk of homelessness than adults and many more uh, homeless youth have been the victim of uh, severe abuse. The sessions also talked about the positive results of uh, reverse society Iran in international corporations which is a flexible recognition of uh, inclusive strategy for different perspectives of treatment, counseling, uh, prevention, and harm reductions. A panelist from uh, World Federation Against uh, Drugs also talked about its uh, TOOS recovery project with the finding of its need assessment where it showed number of NGOs uh, working in the field of addictions is decreasing and most of rural areas are being neglected. A quite upsetting thing that happened in the plenary of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs today, or at least it, it stood out to me, uh, was during uh, the vote to schedule sub some substances. So basically every year the member states of the Commission uh, get to decide based on the recommendations of technical and scientific bodies like uh, the AAHO and the International Narcotics Control Board uh, to place certain substances under international control or to place them under stricter control than they have been before. Um, and one of the votes this year was on three uh, precursors of fentanyl. Um, precursors are chemicals used to produce, um, in this case, fentanyl or its analogs. Um, and analogs are substances which are quite similar um, in structure to, to each other and also have similar effects. Um, so these three uh, fentanyl precursors were already scheduled under the conventions, but the recommendation on the table was to put them in a more strictly regulated category. And we expected the member states to vote in favor of this, so it was not a surprise that they uh, decided to, to put it in a more stricter category. Um, what was quite worrying, um, is the justification that the International Narcotics Control Board uh, gave ahead of the vote. Um, so the technical bodies, the WHO and INCB, when they make these recommendations for scheduling, they have to explain to the member states why these substances should be included under certain conventions and why they should be included in those categories. And these reasons usually include the potential of the substance to cause harm and its similarity to, to other substances in that same category. So in this case, with the fentanyl precursors, the INCB pointed to how these substances can be 10 to 100 times stronger than heroin and how they have been linked to cases of overdose and overdose-related deaths. But the INCB also went on to make sort of a throwaway comment um, that another reason for this scheduling recommendation for stricter control is instances of inadvertent exposure of law enforcement along the distribution chain and the harms caused by this. So it was quite unclear what they meant by this, um, but we can only assume, or at least that's what my mind jumped to immediately, that this refers to several stories, which are honestly mainly myths um, that we've seen reported, particularly in the United States, about police officers experiencing overdose or overdose-related symptoms, other adverse health um, consequences after essentially just getting in contact with, touching or being near fentanyl related substances um, in their operations. So when seizing these substances, uh, for example, and these stories are obviously not true. You, you cannot overdose on fentanyl in this way. 
And stories like these are only meant to perpetuate stigma about substances and the people who use them. And obviously fentanyl um, is one of these highly, highly stigmatized substances. Um, so these stories only create fear. They, they don't tell you anything about the actual harms and how to uh, reduce and mitigate those harms. Um, and yeah, they are untrue. So it was quite worrying to, to see a technical scientific body such as the International Narcotic Control Board allude to these stories as justification for scheduling decisions, even if they didn't, you know, um, particularly say this, but it's, it's hard to see what else they were referring to in this case. This morning, I attended a side event uh, outlining the challenges to effective civil society participation in drug policy making. So this was organized by a number of civil society organizations. I think they also had uh, co-sponsorship from the European Commission, or uh, at least they had a opening statement from someone from the European Commission. Uh, it was aimed more so at member states and um, yeah, other um, regional bodies that uh, would interact with civil society in their policy making. So I, I hope some people were in attendance who can implement these uh, best practices for civil society engagement in their home countries. The European Commission spoke first, like I said, um, and just sort of framed the issue, uh, stressing the importance of involving civil society at all stages um, and outlining some of their efforts to involve civil society more. Um, Peter Sorosi spoke, sort of outlining uh, the gap currently between an ideal scenario and the real experience of civil society involvement. Uh, Peter spoke as a member of the EU Civil Society Task Force. Uh, he stressed the importance of uh, meaningful engagement over just box ticking exercises for civil society engagement um, and yeah, stress the importance of funding from donors and governments in order for advocacy work uh, to be undertaken. Joanna Canedo uh, of YouthRise and also Euro Enput spoke also at this side event, uh, outlining more of a sort of community perspective. Um, Joanna mentioned that it is important for the civil society and the community to build bottom up change. Um, stress the importance of intersectionality in our work when uh, drug policy crosses into the sphere of poverty or gender issues. And also stress that um, people who use drugs are experts in our own lives and should be trusted to make decisions about our own lives, to keep ourselves safe, and also to influence policy about our lives. So that was really nice. Very happy that Joanna was speaking at that. Um, and yeah, it was overall a really good side event that I hope will bring about some positive change for civil society engagement uh, somewhere. The second side event I attended today was called The Inequalities That Drive the HIV AIDS Epidemic Among People Who Use Drugs and People in Prison. This event was organized by the UNODC HIV AIDS section uh, with the support of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs and the UNAIDS and World Health organization. Mostly what was spoken about was um, the inequalities that drive um, the HIV and AIDS epidemic amongst young people who use, uh, amongst people who use drugs. In particular, it was focused on Ukraine. So we had a speaker from the, the executive director of um, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association. We also um, heard from a professor from the University of Yale um, in the US who has who had studied um, Ukraine he spoke about crises like the Ukraine crisis happening right now and COVID-19 and how it impacted harm reduction services and harm reduction delivery within these countries what was there before and then what happened after they um, detailed how some countries came to learn that having take-home doses of op opioid substitution therapy um, resulted in governments understanding how necessary these take-home doses are and how much it relieves clinicians actually from the workload that they have with meeting with clients um, daily if they're getting their daily dose. So it's resulted in, in some better policies in, the, in terms of Nepal and in Ukraine. And then of course now with this, with the crisis happening 
in Ukraine, with the war happening in Ukraine, um, there is just day by day um, trying to adjust to the situation they're in. And um, it was explained that the pharmacies are running out of the drugs, um, where the where the opioid substitution therapy is, where methadone is produced, is in Kharkiv, which has been heavily hit by, by Russia's invasion. So it was interesting to hear how, how they're coping right now. And um, it's heartbreaking to hear the impact that it's having on people who use drugs within the countries. The second session uh, talked about how the synthetic drug strategy uh, is uh, 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 well, making its approach, it's, it's uh, spreading its um, ways to uh, flourish in a way uh, that a lot of uh, drugs that were available before the pandemic are not available as of now and people uh, being users uh, of opiates and synthetic drugs uh, can uh, try different alternatives that are available and these alternatives are available on uh, certain online platforms uh, that are at the moment doing the drug trafficking and the other most uh, fascinating uh, point to this session was how they have uh, shifted to cryptocurrencies when it comes to dealing uh, with money uh, it is also a way to uh, uh, for, for drug traffickers to launder money so this whole uh, session gave me ideas how how these drug trafficking routes are uh, ever changing uh, there is no certainty um, moving on uh, the uh, the the ways that uh, uh, government handle or uh, approach these drug traffickers have also changed because uh, earlier it used to be uh, crop eradication or uh, uh, seizure of uh, substances uh, which is now not possible uh, because geographical locations uh, it can't be accessed uh, through online uh, darknet and the places where they keep uh, all those drugs so there is no physical office or a warehouse where all of these substances are kept so it's much more harder for authorities to reach uh, such uh, drug traffickers uh, then uh, uh, pandemic also gave them uh, um, scope to develop a new strategy and methods to reach to consumers and uh, continue with the drug trafficking routes uh, the most uh, uh, challenging thing in this whole scenario is uh, that virtual markets are not like physical markets uh, and the the use of crypto has uh, changed the way uh, that people deal with the uh, consumer to a buyer relation uh, because crypto doesn't need any sort of uh, uh, authorization to sell products and uh, it is majorly used for money laundering all over the world uh, and also this uh, certain uh, expansion of cyberspace for tra drug traffickers has uh, um, made them uh, apply ways to <clears throat> you know <clears throat> produce much better uh, distribute uh, in, a, in a way that they're not being caught uh, I mean when we, one example could be I mean it, it's not related to uh, opiates but then the recent vape ban in India led to uh, vapes being sold on Instagram and other social media platforms uh, and, and everything is available as it was before it's just the uh, under the curtain, under the carpet now, uh, that people are not being able to see uh, where these products are being sold. And a lot of people are not able to make sense of uh, these substances uh, because a lot of uh, uh, traffickers are using code words and uh, languages that are specific to uh, the users only. Thank you.